الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala, today I want you to walk away and really understand the power of fasting and really the essence behind why Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to fast. I'm going to be adding on and moving on from what Ustad Khalid has already discussed with you, inshallah ta'ala. So to echo what he already said as a benefit for those who maybe came a little bit late, you see, the reason why we fast is actually not known to the majority of Muslims, sadly. We think that we're here to fast so we can kind of understand what the people who are suffering from poverty go through. And even though that's nice, but that's not why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated for us to fast, okay? It's not so that we can uh, work out or pretend or see what it's like to be poor. That's good. That might be a side benefit. But it's not the essence of fasting. Some people think fasting is there. Why? Just because it gives you health benefits. And although fasting does give you health benefits, that's not the reason why Allah Azza wa Jal told me and you to fast. Rather, Allah he tells us very explicitly in the Quran why He wants us to abstain from three things. Food, drink, and intimate relationships that one has with their spouse. Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe. Brothers and sisters, put your hand up if you're a believer in the room right now. If you're a believer in the room right now, what you do is you bring your ear close. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, whenever you hear, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, bring your ear close. Because Allah your Lord is about to command you or He is going to prohibit you something. He's either going to tell you do this or don't do this. In this ayah, we come across a command. Allah, He said, O you who believe, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Allah said, I have prescribed and I have made it written and obligatory upon you that you fast. That you fast. Just you? No. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ This was written and prescribed for those even before you. Musa alayhi salam and his people fasted. Ibrahim and Isa alayhi salam and their people fasted. Dawood and Suleiman alayhi salam and their people they fasted. The same way the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fast. So it's not just them, it's us as well and us and them as well. But why? What's the illah? Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Allah said the reason for this, the wisdom for this, the intent for this, is so you can acquire taqwa. So you can be a person who has taqwa. Now what is taqwa? What is this word? Some people will again misunderstand what this word means, the way they misunderstand the intent behind fasting, which indicates how weak and ignorant we are of the basics of our religion. Some people will say taqwa means fear of Allah. But you have you heard that before. But you have you heard that. I think most people heard that, right? And that is an incorrect and an inadequate de- definition of what taqwa is. Taqwa is hard to define because the Arabic language is very rich. Like, and I'll try my best to explain it to you as much as I can. Taqwa comes from the Arabic word which means wiqaya. Wiqaya means that you take a shield. A man who's on a battlefield, he pulls out a shield. Taqwa comes from this word wiqaya, to take a shield. Now, the one who's on a battlefield, he pulls out his shield to protect himself from harm. So the one who has taqwa, he is putting out a shield, a shield of spirituality to protect himself from the punishment of Allah. So Allah's punishment, it can encompass any one of us. But the one who has taqwa, he pulled out his shield and he's protecting himself and defending himself from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now pay attention, the man in the battlefield, when he has a sword coming at his head and he pulls the shield out, is there an element of fear? Of course there is, because he knows he might get killed. He knows he might get harmed. So that's where the element of fear comes into the definition of taqwa. But it's more than just fear. It's more than just fear. You, fear is a result of it. But the essence of it is that you protect yourself from Allah's anger, His displeasure and His punishment. So now on the battlefield, your sword is going to be made out of metal and other kind of materials. What is this? Sorry, your shield is going to be made up of metal and other materials. What is this shield that you pull out to protect yourself from Allah's punishment? It's two things. Two things. It's obedience 
doing the obedience and staying away from disobedience. So anything Allah told you do, you do it. That's half the shield. The other half of the shield is anything Allah told you stay away from, you stay far away from it. That is your shield. That is taqwa. It is that you protect yourself from Allah's anger and displeasure and punishment by constantly obeying Him and constantly staying away from disobeying Him. So let me give you a practical example of this. Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an, he asked the noble companion Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu, he said, what is taqwa? Describe it for me. Describe, show me a practical example of what taqwa is. He said, have you walked on a path filled with thorns before? Yes, we've all seen what a path with thorns would, be look, would look like, right? Or at least we can picture it in our heads. He said, if you're walking through this path and you have to get from point A to point B and the path is covered with thorns, that are going to prick you, cut you, harm you, make you bleed. How would you walk through that path? How would you? You'd walk very carefully, wouldn't you? You'd make sure every step you take, you take it cautiously. Because you do not want to place your foot in the wrong place. Because if you place your foot in the wrong place, what's going to happen? You're going to get harmed. So you'll be very conscious. This is where another translation comes from. God consciousness, they call it. Huh? These are all parts of the actual definition and the translation of what taqwa is. You'll be conscious of where you place your foot. Very careful. You might not walk that way because you think the thorns are a bit more, bit more thick there. You might not walk that way because the thorns are a bit more dangerous there. So you'll try and maneuver around. You'll be ducking and diving, dodging and swerving so you can protect yourself. But let me ask you a question. Are you bound to get pricked by the thorn? Put your hand up if you think yes. Ultimately, the thorn is going to prick you, right? You will be touched by the thorn, right? The same way you will be touched by sins. You will be touched by sins. You can't avoid it. You will fall into sins every now and again. But when you do get pricked by the thorn, when you do get pricked by the thorn, are you more careful or less careful? You're even more careful. You think, whoa, 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 I put my foot there last time. That one, it looked a bit innocent, but it was sharp. <coughs> <coughs> it cut me deep. So I'm being more careful now where I place my feet and how I move and how I traverse this thorny path. Now brothers, that's the exact same way with sins. The same way you're careful to not let the thorn prick you, you're careful to not let the sins take you. So you're careful how you walk, every step that you take, every move you make, every place that you look, every person that you talk to, every place and thing that you do, you're asking yourself, am I going to possibly fall into sin here? But are you a human being? Are you going to fall into sins? It's going to happen every now and again. But now, after you fall into sin, you're even more careful. You think to yourself, I'm even more careful. I'm not going to... For example, last time you were hanging around with a bunch of guys, and what happened? You ended up getting high. You didn't want to get high. You said, I'm not, I'm not trying to smoke no weed. But when you were hanging around with a certain type of people, you thought you could help, you could, you could, you could firm it. But what happened? You ended up getting high. So now you know never to hang around with those people again. The believer doesn't get bitten by the same hole twice. You don't make the same mistake twice, brothers. Does that make sense? And sisters, you're conscious. You're conscious of the sins and you do your best to stay away from them. So now the question comes to mind, after you've understood what taqwa is, what does that have to do with fasting? So taqwa means the ability to stay away from sins. By putting out a sword, sorry, a shield, pulling out a shield, please don't put out no swords before the feds get onto me. I'm not telling no one to put out no swords. No swords, okay? Put out a shield to protect yourself from Allah's anger and punishment by staying away from sins, right? But what does that have to do with fasting? How does that link to fasting? Now, here's where I want you to pay attention and I want you to be a bit clued on. Sisters and brothers, let me ask you a question. We're made up of two things. There's our, there's our inner and there's our outer, right? Our outer is what? It's our body. And our inner is what? Our heart, okay? The qalb. The spiritual heart. Now the heart has to be fed the same way the body has to be fed. The heart has to be fed the same way the body has to be fed. My question to you is, where do you feed the body from? What do you feed the body with? Food. Food. What else do you feed it with? Drink, right? Desires. When a man has desires for his wife and vice, vice versa in marriage, what's that? That's their body craving something, right? So all year round, are you not feeding your body? You're constantly eating, 
drinking, make sure you're healthy. If you're a married, you know, you're a married couple, you're doing your thing, right? So your body is always full. Your body sometimes is actually what? It's more than full. It's overweight. You've stuffed it. Your body is, whoa, Allah Akbar, brother. You ate a horse. What going for you? So sometimes we do too much. But now the question comes to mind, what about the heart? Who feeds the heart? How much do we feed the heart? Question, what is the food for the heart? What is the food for the heart? Brothers, the food for the heart is worship. The food for the heart is Quran. The food for the heart is Salah. The food for the heart is good deeds. It's good deeds. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us when the heart gets sick, when it becomes stained because of sins, how do you clean and purify the heart and make it healthy again? You start doing good deeds. And the best of good deeds are what? The obligatory actions. The five daily prayers. The zakat, the fasting, so on and so forth. Reciting the Quran. This is food for the heart. Now the question comes to mind, all year round, what do you feed more? Do you feed the body more or do you feed the heart more? Put your hand if you feed the body more. We feed the body more, right? So the heart is starving and the heart is weak. But again, what on earth does the heart have to do with taqwa? What does the heart have to do with the ability of staying away from sins? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, at taqwa when he was telling us about it, he said, at taqwa ha huna. At taqwa ha huna wa yushiru ila sadri thalatha marratin. He said that taqwa piety is right here. It's in the heart. And then he pointed to it three times. He said it's right here. Three times. Three times he said it. So brothers and sisters, the taqwa is in the heart. If you feed the heart with Quran, and you feed the heart with salah, and you feed the heart with fasting, and you feed the heart with sadaqah, and you feed the heart with taraweeh, and you feed the heart with dhikr, and you feed the heart with all of these things, with knowledge, with ilm, beneficial companionship, Things like this, what you're coming to benefit, study and, right, and, and, and do righteous deeds. This makes the heart strong. And when the heart gets strong, the taqwa which is inside the heart, it starts to become stronger. Which means taqwa is the shield that protects you from doing sins. So then the ability to stay away from sins becomes more. It becomes more. It becomes more because the heart became strong. The heart became strong. And in the process, what do you do? You actually starve the body. So the body becomes weaker. Why? Because the desires are connected to the body. Ask, look, look through the books of the Salaf. Look through the books of look through the books of the Salaf. They will always tell you that eating too much is bad for the Iman, for the heart. Imam Mushafi Ta'ala, he said, he said, 40 years. 40 years. Sorry, sorry. He said, 20 years, 20 years. I never filled my stomach once. I never filled it. I never filled my stomach. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he said, since the day I became Muslim, I never filled my stomach. Remember the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that the stomach is divided into three categories, right? Thuluthun li ta'ami, wa thuluthun li sharabi, wa thuluthun li nafasi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that one third of the stomach is for food, one third of the stomach is for water, and one third is for you to breathe, bro. Breathe. Some of you eat so much after iftar, you shove all the samosas and all that food down your mouth that you're in tarawih, bruv, su you're suffocating, akhi. You're, you're finding it hard. You, honestly, you filled it up so much, it's like you just got punched in the stomach because you didn't leave that space for air. So the Prophet is telling you, don't fill up your stomach. So Sahaba understood this. And they said, what? We never filled our stomachs after this. You know why? Because the more you feed the body, the more the body, what? It becomes a needy. Give me more, 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 more. So all the desires connected to the body, all of that greed, that you know, zina, fornication. Look at the people that are sleeping around. Look, there's something to do with their diet. They don't control what they eat. Look at the people who are loose. They're always sleeping around with girls. When girls are sleeping around with boys. You'll notice these people, they find it hard to control their diets. Look at the people who take drugs. Look at the people who are partying. Look at the people who are doing inappropriate things. They struggle to control their diet. If you cannot even control your, the food that you put in your mouth, how are you going to control these desires? How are you going to control these desires? So you train yourself to control yourself from eating that which Allah made halal. Halal, food is halal. But if you can control yourself from eating what is halal, and it's in your face every day, and you need it to survive, then brothers, of course you can control yourself. 
Sisters, of course you'll be able to control yourself from the things that are haram. Of course you'll be able to control yourself. So you're training yourself. And that's why the Sahaba never used to eat much. That's why Imam Muhammad Taala said, he said, a person who fills his stomach, who fills his stomach, this person, they will never have a heart that's soft. They'll never be able to cry in Salah. They'll struggle. Why is it that people are praying in Salah and everyone's crying, but you're there, you know, you're thinking about, you know, when is it going to finish? Your heart is weak, brothers, because your body is strong. Your body is stronger than the heart. So Ramadan, brothers, in these long fasts, you make your body weaker. You weaken the body. And through it, you weaken the desire to do sin, the want to do sin. The body's out there telling the heart, listen, listen, listen. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, clock this girl right now. Maybe have a conversation with her. But the heart is strong. So shut up, bro. Man's in charge. We're just, we're about to pray taraweeh tonight. You misbehave, I'm going to give you one date and that's it, iftar. So the heart is dominant now. The heart is dominant now. And when the heart is dominant, brothers, what happens? The issue is the taqwa in the heart, it grows. The taqwa in the heart, it becomes strong. So then it doesn't make sense now that when iftar time comes, you eat a lot. Some people put on more weight in Ramadan than, than, than they lose it. Am I wrong? Some people put more weight on in Ramadan than they lose it. You know why? Because in that short amount of time, you overeat. You overeat and you're already lethargic, so you're not going to be doing much exercise. So then that never gets, that fat doesn't get burnt and it just settles in your body. So you actually come out worse. You come out worse, right? So then now the smart person realizes that in the month of Ramadan, I have to lessen the eating, to starve and make my body weaker, and I have to increase the ibadah, I have to increase the worship to make my heart stronger. So then brothers, now you understand, sisters, now you understand why the concept of worship is so big in Ramadan. It's not just fasting, the taraweeh. Why is it that we pray these long prayers after Isha, brothers and sisters? It's because you feed the heart. You're not going to get a chance. Allah knows all year round, you're going to go back to work. You're going to go back to your life. This kind of intensity, Allah doesn't expect it from you. So He gives you one month. Salaamu alaikum, Mr. Wavy. Allah gives you this one month. This one month to really build your heart and make it as strong as you possibly can. Because when Ramadan finishes and Shaitan is off the chain and he's running riot in the streets and he's ready to take you back to the hellfire, the path to the hellfire. <coughs> no, you're a bit more stronger this time. You can say no, Shaitan. No, no. But then look at the people. Wallahi, the moment you, the moment the moon is sighted, and we know in my culture we call it Chandra. Put your hand up if you're a Paki. You're Afghan, bro. Now you're trying to, you're trying to claim us. Usually Afghans don't want to claim it, even though they live, even though half of the ones out here they live in Peshawar and Pakistan. Mashallah, Mashallah. I'm happy. We're welcome to take you. It's like the whole Barwani Somali thing. You know Barwanis? They don't like to claim that they're Somali in it sometimes. But really and truly, they're there, in it? <laughs> so the Pakistanis, we have this thing called Chandrat, yeah? Which means the night of the moon. The night of the moon, when the moon is sighted. So you know on South Broadway what they're all doing, man. It's like, what happened, bro? Last night, you thought, 29th night, you thought I might have been Laylat al Qadr. You were saying, oh Allah, save me from the hellfire. Save me from the hellfire. And now you're out in the street smoking shisha, watching the girls playing music loud, driving your cars up and down like a madman. Akhi, wallah, you know why? You know why? Because you didn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the month that you were, the way you were supposed to. Your heart became very weak. So the moment shaitan got left, let off the chain, the moment shaitan got let off the chain, he grabbed you. He grabbed you. So now you need to what? Prepare yourself for this war that's going to come and hit you the moment Ramadan finishes. You need to prepare yourself for this absolute assault that's going to come your way. Okay? From the shayateen of the humans and the shayateen of the jinn. They're going to come for you. And the way you do it is by the taraweeh. is by the Quran. My sisters and brothers, I beg you, read a lot of Quran. You see, the month of Ramadan is a month of fasting, right? But like in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he described Ramadan in the Quran, he didn't describe it with fasting. He didn't. He didn't. Ramadan is a month in which you make dua. Ramadan is a month in which you give sadaqah. Most people pay their zakat in Ramadan, right? Ramadan is a month of night prayer, the taraweeh, right? Ramadan is a month of fasting. But Allah didn't describe it with any of those acts of worship. Allah said, Shahr Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. Which month is it? It's 12 months in a year. unzila It is the one in which Allah he sent down the Quran. 
Allah told you this is a month of Quran, my sisters and brothers. So why is it that you don't have a relationship with this book? Sisters and brothers, Allah is the king of kings. He is above his throne. And he spoke to us on this earth. We had the privilege of hearing his speech. And we didn't build a relationship with it. How can this be? You want to make your heart strong? Sisters and brothers, make your heart strong with the Quran. Make your heart strong with the Quran. How is it that you are running after everything except for this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, أَتَتَّبِعَنَّ سَرَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ حَذْبَ الْقُذَّةِ بِالْقُذَّةِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that you are going to follow the people who came before you, are Muslims, the nations and the religions who came before you, you're going to follow them. You're going to follow them step by step. حَتَّى لَوْ دَخَلُوا فِي جُحْرَ ضَبٍ لَا دَخَلْتُمُوهُ If these kuffar were from the previous nations, if they were to go into a lizard hole, you would follow into the lizard hole with them. The Sahaba said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, and Yahud and Nasara, are you talking about the Jews and the Christians? The Prophet said, For men. Who else am I talking about? So this Ummah is going to follow the Jews and the Christians. They're going to follow them step, they're going to follow them shoulder to shoulder, step by step. They're going to walk as if, if they were to go into a lizard hole, they'll follow them. They'll follow them. So, how is it that we are following the Jews and the Christians with regards to the Quran? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said something about the Jews and the Christians. And wallahi, we have become just like them in this regard. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. He said, you know the Jews, and the, the Jews, they were wandering in the desert and they didn't have food to eat. Because in the desert you starve to death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَضَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامَ وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَى Allah said, we send them down manna وَالسَّلْوَى Which is food that Allah sent from the sky. Brothers, this special food, my sisters, this was special food that Allah sent from the heavens for these people. Is that nice? Allah sent him food from heaven. <laughs> food from the heavens for them. Imagine you're in the desert, they don't have to go around hunting, looking for water. Allah sent in food from the sky for them. Food from the sky for them. But then the next page, what did Allah say about these people? They were, you know what? They didn't realize the value of what they had. Food from heaven. They didn't realize that. So what did they say? إِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَى لَنْ نَصْبِرَ عَلَىٰ طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ فَادْعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُخْرِجَ لَنَا مِمَّا تُنْبِتُ الْأَرْضُ مِنْ بَقَلِهَا وَقِثَائِهَا وَفُوبِهَا وَعَدَسِهَا وَبَصَلِهَا They said, Musa, this is too much. We eat in the same food every day. Manna was said, no, 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 no. We want something else. We want, we want, we want some, we want some, see, we ask, make dua to Allah to bring out food from the earth for us. We want some onions. Give us some onions. They want his stinky breath. That's them. The point is, they didn't want what Allah sent down to them. They didn't want what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down to them. So look what Musa said. He said, Qala. He said, Atastabidiluna ladhi huwa adana bil ladhi huwa khair. He said, Are you asking to exchange that which is worse for that which is better? The food from the sky Allah is sending down for you people. And you want things to come out of the earth? This is coming from heaven. And you want onions? You want onions? That's what you want? Wallahi, brothers and sisters. That's exactly like us. Forget food coming from the sky. Allah sent down Quran to us. From above the seventh sky, from above Allah's arsh, He sent down Quran for us. He sent it down. And we abandoned it. Rather, what, what do we go after? You know, when a person gets stressed, what does he do? He finds comfort in music. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Music, the Prophet Allah said in the Quran, is the salt of shaitan, is the voice of shaitan. You get stressed, you find comfort in the voice of shaitan. The adhan of shaitan. You get stressed, what do you do? You pick up the phone, you call a girl, you go sleep with her. But the believers, they find peace and tranquility in the book of Allah. They read the Quran. You see, this Quran, we've not understood its value, my sisters and brothers. Everything in the earth, every, every, everything feels its value. Allah said, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلْ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ Allah said, if we set this Qur'an down on top of a mountain, if we send the Qur'an down on top of a mountain, you would have seen the mountain crumble its, to dust. Why? Out of the fear of Allah. The mountain would destroy itself. The mountain would collapse and shatter and destroy itself. Out of the fear of Allah when the, if the Qur'an came on top of it. But then what does that say about me and you and my heart and your heart? That the Qur'an is constantly being read. We've memorized it. Some of us carry this surah. Put your hand up if you, if you memorize the surah of the Qur'an. Put your hand up. We will memorize Al-Fatiha. Do you know how powerful Al-Fatiha is? Sisters and brothers, do you know how powerful Al-Fatiha is? 
it is a summary of the whole Quran inside of there. But you hear it and you don't cry. You hear it at the same time, you could be listening to it, watching, looking at a girl. You could be listening to music and recite it and it won't touch you. Why? The hearts have become hard. So what does that say? Mount Everest would crumble to dust out of fear if the Quran came on top of it. Does that mean that your heart is harder than a mountain? Yeah. That's exactly what it means. Some of our hearts are harder than mountains. Allah said about the Jews and we just like them. ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts, they became hard. They became very hard. Allah says sometimes they became, they became like rocks. Rather, Allah said, أَشَدُّ They became even stronger and harder than rocks. Sometimes Allah said, the rock, if the strong stream of water flows through the rock, it will split the rock. But our hearts, they are not even ready to split or break. They're that strong. They're that hard. Not strong, they're hard. The Quran, it doesn't penetrate it. Allah said, this Quran, brothers and sisters, this Quran can bring a dead person to life. If there was something that would remove a mountain or make the dead speak again, there was something that would remove a mountain or make the dead speak again, it would be this Quran. But why can't you and me benefit from its virtues? We don't read it. We don't read it. The Salaf would read the Quran twice a day. Ask yourself how. Ask yourself how. My Shaykh Ustad Abdul Rahman, Hafidullah, he went to Shaykh Salih Usaymi and he asked him a question. He said, How is it the Salaf could read the Quran once in a day, twice in a day? Makes no sense. He said, it doesn't make any sense. It sounds a bit, you know, a bit too much. The sheikh said, you're trying to compare yourself to these great men. But you never came with what they came with. These were men who gave their life to Allah and his deen, worshipping him day and night. So Allah allowed them to be able to perform and feats that are not normal. So you're trying to ask yourself, it's, it's, like, it's like a guy who never, who never picked up any weights in the gym. And how are these guys picking up a bench press in 150 kg? How, 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 how? Makes no sense. But you never put in the work. So you know, why are you trying to compare yourself to them? Put the work in and then you'll see what happened for you. And Wallah, I swear by Allah, my teacher, and he's man who's walking. And put your hand if you know Ustad Abdul Rahman. Put your hand if you know Ustad Abdul Rahman. He's walking, right? Last year, he finished the Quran once every day. He finished it once every day. I saw it with my own eyes. He finished the Quran once every day. What? He's normal like me and you. Who read after Fajr. And you will know he was given lessons last year in Ramadan. He even let Taraweeh in some places. And he was hanging out and chilling as well. But how? Allah put Barakah in his time. He finished the Quran once every day last, month, uh, last Ramadan. Once every day. In fact, if, I think it was, just, it was on, by the 17th day, he said he'd only finished it 16 times. So it was just taking him a day and a little bit more to finish one, the Quran once. So he's a walking, talking human just like me and you. It can be done. It can be done. It can be done. The point is you have to put the work in. So sisters, brothers, this Ramadan, please make this the month of Quran. Because the Quran will feed your heart. The Quran will feed your soul. The Quran will feed your spirit. And then the, the Salah will. And then the Taraweeh it adds on more. You will come out. This Ramadan is strong. You will come out. Inshallah ta'ala, of course you're going to dip. It's not going to be that same level of intensity. But you'll be stronger than when you were before. And that's how Ramadan works. And that's how Umrah works. And that's how Hajj works. Whenever you do these things, you're never going to be the same level when you come back as you were when you were doing it. But you never drop back down to where you were. So after Ramadan, if I was here, I'll be here. When Ramadan finishes, I'll come down to here. Not back where I was. I'll be here. Next Ramadan, I go up. Like that. And Ramadan to Ramadan, you're increasing yourself and making yourself better. I just want to mention one last thing, inshallah ta'ala, and then I'm off. I know I've slightly gone over my time, but it's important because I know some of you got exams. Put your hand if you got exams during Ramadan. Put your hand. I'm going to tell you something powerful now, inshallah ta'ala, okay? Do not think that you're at a disadvantage because you're fasting. Rather, the fasting is going to give you more strength in the month of Ramadan. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You see Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, who is the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, one day she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because her hands were becoming very weak and destroyed because of all the hard work that she was doing with her hands. Her hands were becoming very weak and destroyed because of all the hard work that she was doing with her hands. So she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and she asked for some help. She said, can I have some help to help me do my work because my hands are becoming destroyed. And the Prophet said, rather I'll give you something better. He said, before you go to sleep, Say Subhanallah 33 times, say Alhamdulillah 33 times, and say Allahu Akbar 33 times. 
Yes, 33. The 34 narration is another narration before you correct me. Yeah? 30, 33 times? 33 times? 33 times. He said, say this before you go to sleep. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. Before you go to sleep. Question. Did Fatima radiallahu anha ask for a physical solution to her physical problem? Was it a physical problem? Her hands were becoming destroyed and weak. So she wanted some help because her hands were becoming destroyed, worn and torn. But what the Prophet gave her from the outside, does it seem like he gave her a physical solution? No, from the outside, it seems he, like he just told her basically, you know, just be patient and just worship Allah, right? That's what it sounds like. But then the ulama said something powerful. They said it can never be that you come to the Prophet for a problem, with a problem, and he never gave you the solution for it. It can never be that you came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you asked him for a solution to your problem except that he gave you the answer to your problem. So then they said it has to be that when the Prophet told her to do this tasbih, to say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu akbar, it has to be that it would give her hands strength. And they were right. They were right. Because doing the dhikr, doing the tasbih and the tahmeed and the takbir, doing this actually gives you physical strength. And I'll give you more evidence. I'll give you more evidence. I'll give you more evidence. In the Quran, when Allah was talking about the people of Ad, to whom Hud was sent, Allah said, that Allah said to them, <coughs> do istighfar, say astaghfirullah, say astaghfirullah. Allah, I seek forgiveness from you. And what? Allah said, I will increase you, Allah will increase you in strength upon strength. So you will get more strength by saying astaghfirullah. Again, clear cut proof and evidence that doing dhikr on the tongue, reading Allah's name and remembrances and mentioning them on your tongue will give you physical strength in your body. Will give you physical strength in your body. Will give you physical strength in your body. And disobeying Allah actually weakens the body. Disobeying Allah weakens the body. One time the Prophet وسلم, he saw a man and he had a ta'weez. In Somali they call it a hirsi, yeah? In, in my country, we call it a ta'weez. In English, we call it a, we call it a what? A talisman, a medallion. In Arabic, you call it a tamima. So he's wearing a, one of these amulets. They think that it, it, it would, it would wound, ward away a sickness, right? So the Prophet said, inzi'ha, take it off. La tazeeduka illa wahana. It will not increase you in anything except weakness. Why? Because you're doing shirk, you're wearing something. This is shirk. This is disbelief in Allah. Minor shirk. Only Allah can protect you from harm and evil. But you're wearing this thinking it will help you. Rather, it will not do anything except increase you in more weakness. How would it increase you in weakness? Because you're disobeying Allah. So all of these evidences show you when you sin, your physical body becomes weak. When you obey Allah, specifically by doing dhikr and reading the dhikr, your body becomes physically strong. It becomes physically strong. Ibn Taymiyyah was a warrior. The Mongols, they came and they ransacked the Muslims. They spilled their blood all the way from Khurasan all the way up to Iraq. When they came to Iraq, they spilled all of their blood. They came to Damascus. When they came to Damascus, Ibn Taymiyyah gathered an army. An army. And he went in and he ran havoc in the ranks of the Mongols. And he was a formidable foe on the battlefield. But he wasn't a very built man. He wasn't a bodybuilder built like a tank. What did he do? After every Fajr, he would sit in the morning and do dhikr. He would remember Allah. His student Ibn al-Qayyim would come and say, Shaykh, Shaykh, breakfast is ready, come eat. He would say, leave me for this. Because if I do not do this right here, my body becomes weak. He said, this is my breakfast. So brothers, sisters, if you're worried about exams, do not think that the lack of food will make you weak. Rather, increase in your dhikr. Increase in reading Quran, it will make you strong. When you start your day, start it with dhikr, start it with Quran. It will give you physical strength. Sahab were fighting on the battlefield in famine. Do you know what famine is? Do you know what famine is? Famine is lack of food, no food. Poverty, their stomachs were caving in because of the lack of food. And they were on the battlefield. 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 So it shows you that strength doesn't come from food. Strength 
comes from fikr. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi would take out wrestlers, the strongest of wrestlers. He would take them out, and he wasn't built like a tank. He was strong, he had broad shoulders on lambari, but he wasn't the biggest out of all of them. He wasn't sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but he was the strongest. Why? He was the strongest because he was the one who worshipped Allah the most. So that's that's for you guys who are worried about exams, worried about work. Inshallah, don't worry, we'll not get in the way. Just make sure you focus, you don't lose sight of your Ramadan. Do your dhikr, read your Quran, it will only, inshallah ta'ala, increase you in strength. And you'll be shocked, inshallah ta'ala, at the level of strength that you have, despite the nourishment of food and drink. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? With that said, finally, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, stay away from sins in the month, because you're not just fasting from food, drink, and desires. You're also fasting from sins Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said One who doesn't leave a filthy speech Allah has no need for this person's fast He has no need for it Does that make sense? Because it defeats the purpose And it diminishes the reward So with that said I've got to love you and leave you Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Hey guys I really hope that you benefited from that video Before you go I want to ask you a really important question Have you guys ever thought about Studying Islam And seeking knowledge? If not, then I want you to reflect upon this hadith of the Prophet The Prophet said that seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every single Muslim. Of course, that doesn't mean you have to be a scholar, but you have to know the basics in order for you to be the best possible slave and worshipper of Allah that you can possibly be. So, we decided to provide a solution for this. You see, many people want to study, but they don't have the means or the resources to do so. So we set up an online institute called the Knowledge College where you can study Islam from the comfort of your own home. So if you want more information on the Knowledge College and you'd like to sign up, go to the link below, check out the website, and hopefully we'll see you on the other side. Assalamu alaikum.